All right. Uh, so I want to talk about dialectics, uh, and what I'm calling the five steps of synthesis. So um, you know, the question I want to ask is, what do we mean by synthesis, right? And you know, kind of going back to Matt's original talk uh, on the first night, we we often hear that you know, in philosophy and just in discourse, you know, we should be looking at synthesizing diverse points of view, right? When we find a thesis or an antithesis, look for higher ground, look for what unifies, right? And what I feel is that this can often be done in a sloppy way. And I want to give a couple examples of how we can do this more precisely, how I've seen it work out well. Um, right, and I want to give an example from public discourse, uh, which is Obama. Uh, I'm going to see if the video works here. Um, but these are pundits who have analyzed how Obama speaks, and they point to him doing exactly this type of synthesis. Uh, so let's hear him, and let's, let's think, how well do we think he does? How, how educating is this for us? E pluribus unum, out of many, one. He gives a speech that presages his entire political message of 2008, which is this sort of postpartisan argument. Now, even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters, the negative ad peddlers, who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them tonight, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. Obama was born with two great gifts. Uh, one is his mind, and the other is his ability to speak to large groups of people. There are three things that Obama does that really makes that speech effective. He wants concrete detail. He likes story, and he loves antithesis, the use of repetition and structure to show contrast. There is not a liberal America or a conservative America. There is one America. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. The pundits like to slice and dice our country into red states and blue states. But I've got news for them, too. We worship an awesome God in the blue states. And we okay, don't so like federal there's more. I mean, poking around in our lives. So my, in the I want to give my assessment of this, OK? Uh, I think, you know, how satisfying was this? How educating was this? I think it was okay, right? I'd give it a B plus, right? I'd say the first ones they were kind of nice, they sound cool, but they're not actually telling us anything. The last one started to, and he has a couple more that I think start to, where he says, well, okay, there's this actual issue, you know, in the blue states we value this, but actually there's this other part of redness that we also value. So he was starting to get into that, but eh, it was okay. Uh, I want to give an example of something that really bothered me and that I, I worked on, and I tried to see how we could do better. Uh, but I want to say, so I'm suspect of these three steps. I'm suspect of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? Because I don't think it's that easy. And you know, we can look at this as P, not P, and P and not P, which is just a, a paradox, right? It's not real. So how do you actually uh, connect these things? Uh, people say this came from Hegel. It actually didn't, right? And you can actually go look at the history. Hegel never said this, right? It's been broadly discredited. Someone else, uh, Fichte, uh, introduced this. Uh, Schelling took, took up this terminology, Hegel did not. Okay, so there's no real, uh, there's no real heritage to that triplet you know, being the right way to do things. What did Hegel actually say? He said, well, so the, the pundits say this is only a partial comprehension uh, that we have to correct. What Hegel actually did believe is that truth emerges from error. Um, holism emerges from partial truths that are progressively corrected so they're one side and this is overcome. Okay, so this is more the actual process. It's not just three steps, but it's an ongoing process. Um, so there may be more than just these three. I think not three, that there are actually five. Okay, I think we go from thesis to antithesis to juxtaposition or oscillation, where we say, well, there are these two different things, and you're kind of flip-flopping between them, right? Which is a good place to get to. It's good to know that the first is not true, the second is not true. It actually might be both. You're open to both. Good step. But I believe the next fourth step is qualification or quantification. When is the thesis true? When is the antithesis true? Right? Starting to establish those conditions. And then synthesis is when you actually nail it and you say, I understand the underlying concept. I have the better concept. Uh, and this will repeat. You're going to continue going through this and synthesize larger and larger concepts. Um, OK, so you know, if this is P, not P, and P and not P, uh, the qualification, I say as well, you know, if x is greater than 5, p. If x is less than 5, not p. And the synthesis, p times x minus 5. Right? You, just, you just have it. Okay. 
Um, and this is shorter and it's more composable. Okay, so that's the kind of thing I wanna do. Now, I'm gonna really briefly <laughs> race through a thing I worked on about pandemics because this is such a real-world case and we can, we can just do so much better. Thesis, we must take strong action to protect public health. We should do strong interventions, strong lockdown. Okay, I'm gonna try to really finish, but it's... Uh. Antithesis, you know, no lockdown. We must preserve the economy, don't do any interventions. Juxtaposition, there are conflicting needs, let's balance both of them somehow. Eh, C plus. Uh, we should do an intermediate response, a medium lockdown. B minus. I, I, don't, I don't get how you, how did you do that? Show your work. C, must protect holistic well-being of society, which includes both medical and economic well-being. I'm like, okay, well that's actually getting somewhere. I give it a B plus, because it's accounting for something more holistic. But, uh, you know, for, for a juxtaposition, maybe that's as good as we can hope for. Um, but we're at a B plus, and look, this is society we're talking about. Why settle for B plus? How do we get to that A? Um, let's start with qualifying, and then let's get to synthesis. So qualify, you know, I'm gonna show you, here's some things you could do. You could do, you know, not very much lockdown, a lot of people get infected. Uh, red is like doing some lockdown, yellow is doing <laughs> a bit, green is like, hey, we're free. People are vaccinated, we're free. This is like, no, let's do the medium one, right? Let's keep cases lowish, but you're spending a lot on lockdown. So you're counting for both, right? You're counting the cost of the lockdown and the cost of the infections. And this is like, okay, strong lockdown. We paid a lot for it, but we did it once. Now we can reopen. We'll lock down again if there's another small blip. Cool. Uh, that's maybe a thing that we want to do. There's costs and benefits to each of it. You're paying for the lockdown and you're paying when people get infected. So you sort of want a sweet spot. And it's an iterated game, so the decision you make right now plays you know, into the future time step. So it's this iterated dynamical system and you can use Bellman's equation, which is from economics and also used in reinforcement learning. You can write some code. And now I produce this graph where I'm like, okay, if this is the transmissibility of the disease and this is the cost per infection, the deadliness of the disease, I can now tell you how many cases you should tolerate that find that sweet spot. And we find that like this is a nice picture. That was one point, that was a different point. Uh, this is an intermediate point. And you know, this phase diagram looks a lot like water, you know, and we don't have to go into that, but like these are actually distinct phases. There's solid liquid gas, uh, you know, there's a critical point, a triple point. Um, but here, you know, we have the synthesis. It's part of it's true in those cases. We have antithesis, true in those cases. We have nebulosity, we have an alternative that's not the thesis, not the antithesis, it's not both, it's not neither. Um, and we know where one stops and the next one begins. Uh, you know, and you can do actual physics on this and like, and this whole thing is the synthesis. And so in a sense it feels like, you know, we actually understand now like what's going on here and we know where the sharp boundary comes from. And we didn't know this would be a sharp boundary. We might have thought, oh, well, it's a continuum, you know, depending how deadly the disease is, you'll sort of gradually ramp down your response. Okay, it turned out not to be true, at least not in our analysis. Um, right, so just understanding it like that, it's like, all right, I think I actually get it. I give it an A minus. There's more things to do here, which we could go into. This doesn't fully answer it, but we're off to the races. We understand how to, how to proceed. Um, right, so we did a few things. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can grade it and say we did these things well, um, and yeah. And so the question I want to leave us with is what would we do to this for more things, right? You can do this for climate change, uh, but what about inner things, right? This is sort of an obvious case. This is about like tangible stuff, but what about like stances in general, right? Uh, and so I think we can do this for our inner work also. Did it? Ooh. Right. I just want to see what it felt like to be up here. Okay. So when Matt did his talk, um, there was 
nebulosity and pattern. And that's, that sparked an association in my mind uh, based on my reading of Elkanon Goldberg about the brain. And that he said like our understanding of right and left hemisphere is kind of like 30, 40 years out of date. When we think about, oh, the right hemisphere is about creativity and it's visual. And the left hemisphere is about logical thinking and language. That's not true at all. That it's based on like early studies where people had injuries and affected things and they, they observed what's going on. And they said basically the right brain is about nebulosity. That it's about making sense of the world where things are ambiguous when you're encountering them for the first time. It's about how do I take ambiguous data and just make some kind of decision. The left brain is about routine. It's about, okay, now that I understand something, how can I make it, how can I recognize the patterns, turn it into routine? And so this is a good like basic understanding. It's really interesting that when you're first born, it's heavy right brain. You're using your right brain for everything. If you get an injury on your right brain um, when you're young, you're completely incapacitated and can't actually learn well. It's, it's debilitating. If you're old, you get an injury in your right brain. A lot of times people don't even know. You get an injury in your left brain, suddenly all these things you've learned, all the language, everything you could do, you know, diminishes. It's really debilitating. Um, Ian McGoldcrust wrote a book called The Master and Emissary. And in this, he tells a, a story, it's taken from another author, I can't remember who, that basically it's, there's a master, he realizes I've got this city to run, I can't do it, I need an emissary to do it. The emissary does all this work. The emissary screws up the whole city when they decide they're the master. And basically, super short, the right brain knows what it knows and it knows what it doesn't know. The left brain only knows what it knows. It's the, the emissary. We get heavily stuck in left brain thinking. We lose all these capacities. And the thesis of this book is basically, we have just become increasingly more left brain, left brain, left brain, and it's undermining society. So I'm just left with this, like maybe these, these balancing between nebulosity and pattern are not equal that there may be a value to nebulosity that's greater than that of the pattern. All right, so I'm up here mostly to kind of give my pitch for what I want to do this evening, which was supposed to be a sing-along on Thursday night, and then I had family stuff happen. Um, from what I understand from the first Fluidity Forum, it was kind of organic. Duncan was playing piano, people were singing. And I thought, if I'm going to participate in this, give me a second, I'm not breathing. Hang on. <laughs> Don't count that toward my total. Um, <laughs> no, if I'm going to participate, the thing that means most to me and always has is music. I communicate through music. Anybody I've ever been in a relationship with, I've been friends with, has gotten just YouTube links from me randomly. This is what's keeping me sane right now. Um, and Matt, in general, has had to feel things where he's like, you know what, later, can you just explain to me what this song means to you and why? <laughs> it's just a random song. But um, music kind of runs through my family. Mostly just my mother's family, but all of us can sing, and a lot of us play instruments, and it comes, I don't know how far back beyond that, but it comes from her father. To the point that when we sing happy birthday at like family reunions, everyone's harmonizing. I don't know, it probably sounds pretentious, but to us it's just something that we do. So it's been present in my life from the beginning. My parents exposed me to lots 
of music, so many genres. Um, and it just, it's what I do when I'm sad, it's what I do to express when I'm happy. It's kept me alive when I've had some really down, dark times with depression. Um, and so I have come to appreciate and enjoy and respect watching how people engage with music. And as I've been talking to other people about this, I've said, yeah, you can. The last person I talked to was Ian, and I was talking about how it, um, you can get a similar effect through visual arts. You can get a similar effect through dance and movement. You can get a similar effect through the written word. But all of these are accessing a part of yourself that you don't usually express when you're just speaking to each other. Um, and that's deeply meaningful for me. So tonight at the after party, I'm really hoping that after dinner, you guys would be willing to participate with me. I put together, this is my random creative idea. I put together this little cootie catcher that has eight different song types. So I have those. They are actually like topics, but if you don't want it, go with whatever you get. I won't even take that long, I promise you. So the opt out there is the rule. <laughs> That's, I'm not big on rules, uh, but the rule that I have is if you don't want to do one of the ones that comes up, I'd like you to sing a song that's personally meaningful to you. And it doesn't matter how well you sing or don't, because it's not about that. And I, because it has the theme of a sing along, I figure people can just sing if they want to along with you. There's a lot of YouTube karaoke tracks, but if you sing a personally relevant song, you don't have to explain to me or to anyone else why it's relevant or meaningful. You can if you want, but you don't have to. I just want to see how it affects how people relate to each other, especially because we've gotten a chance, it's probably better tonight than it would have been on Thursday, because we've gotten a chance to talk and get to know each other a little bit. So anyway, that's just my little pitch for this, and I hope you guys give it a try. I just really wanted to be on this stage. So I just want to take a couple minutes to talk about little things, little things that we can do for ourselves and for other people that are so important. And for me, in my experience, it's been really easy for me as an introverted person to just hang out in my own little cocoon. And there's this, this other part of me that's just dying for connection with other people. And I love connecting with other people. But what I'm really about is about holding space and about um, helping people to, um, to feel that sense of self-expression in themselves. Because every single person is such a unique individual of expression that no one else is. And so we were talking about this earlier and it just really got me thinking about how I've cultivated this ritual of getting up in the morning and listening to a song every day, whether I do it by headphones or whether I do it out loud and I move my body. And it really helps me to just get into the day and just to help me move. And so what I do now is I have several friends where I actually send them that song. And I tell them happy whatever day of the week it is. And I've gotten a lot of really positive feedback from that because for me it raises my vibration. And if I'm, especially if I'm going to work that day, um, it really puts me into a mindset of joy and uh, an expression. 
And so um, doing those little things for myself and for other people um, are really important. And I feel like in our culture, uh, there's a lot less of that going on, especially after COVID. And so I just wanted to presence that, that, you know, just being a space holder, you know, sending a song, sending a text message even, um, or just giving a little bit of love goes a really long way for people. Um, and it goes a long way for myself. And so uh, just in summary, I, I just wanted to um, to presence the, the raising of the vibration of the planet. So thanks. So I'm 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 a 80% strong believer that uh, dolphins are equivalently as conscious as, or like cetaceans in general are equivalently as conscious as human beings are, um, and have like an extremely advanced linguistic capacity as well. Um, give me one second. There's some like stats here that I'll read through. Um, besides something as simple as like encephalization coefficient, which is like. Um, well, let's not start with that. Let's start with like, the thing that convinces us neurobiologically that like we are very special is like the neofrontal cortex um, and the amount of like neurons of a particular kind that you would find there. Um, the, that particular type is, um, yeah, neocortical neurons. Um, and there's also another type of neuron called like a spindle neuron, which doesn't have much branching that are only found in like species with like high cognitive capacity, like apes and human beings and elephants and things like that. But actually in a 2014 study, the long finned pilot whale has more neocortical neurons than any other mammal, including humans to date. Um, they also are born with about like, so most animals are born with like 90% of their brain capacity. Human beings are born with like 64% and then they grow. Dolphins are born with something like around there, like 50 to 40% and grow the rest of their connections throughout their life. Um, all we've actually decoded from dolphins in, form, in the form of their like language is the names that they give one another, um, which are like these signature kind of chirps that they give one another. And what we've known about that is quite fascinating. We know that every dolphin doesn't have a unique name, but rather has a relational name. So like you and I would have, I would have a name just for you and you would have a name just for me. And then you would have a name just for me and I would have a name just for you. And their minds actually like are biologically different in a way that like their like audio visual processing is like 60% greater than ours is. So like, um, words and like language uh, inspire like more images in their mind than they would for different human beings. Um, another interesting thing about them is that these words, these like relational names are passed down from generation to generation. So like the matriarch will teach their children about all of the relational names that it had with other pods and things like that. And that is independent of the dolphin creating their own relational names whenever they do meet the dolphins in question, they'll like generate their own. But until then, they'll use like kind of the references of other things. Um, there's also documented interspecies communication between like porpoises, bottlenose dolphins, orcas, 
uh, about fishing patterns and temperature changes um, that track from like the around the Florida region all the way up to the Arctic Circle. We've actually like traced that there's like communication that's happening between those. Um, what's the what's the final point? I guess. Um, oh. The, the, the last one, I guess, is just more fun. Um, they're also conscious breathers, um, which means that if you give them anesthesia or try to put them under at all, they will asphyxiate and die because they do not have an unconscious mechanism for breathing. We have kind of like a dual mode where we can consciously breathe and then let go of that and it unconsciously continues anyway. But even through sleep, dolphins are like, dolphins and whales are like consciously breathing. So what are what are whales doing in the in the water while they like drift around at sea? They are meditating. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's my thesis. I've only got one slide, but it's a big one. It's too big to fit on the screen. Start myself off with five minutes. Uh, all right. This is the uh, this is the book "Shaping Things" by Bruce Sterling, and I want to talk about spines. Um, these are stages of the techno-social complex, and I made this graphic to represent the uh, main idea from his book. Uh, the old techno-social complexes are still with us, layered with the new, so we just constantly accrete layers and layers of history of the techno-social complex, in which he's got a period of the... Oh, this is... Sorry about that. I've got that set up to not mirror. Thank you for letting me know. All right. So he has, there we go, that's better. Um, these are, this is a uh, image I made to represent uh, the stages of the book, uh, the stages of history described in the book, where in prehistory, all you had were objects. They were just these inert things. And then we started having what he classifies as artifacts. It's an artifact if it was made, used, and powered by muscle and folklore. And then around 1500 CE, we started getting machines which he defines as having many moving parts, so they're not powered by hand. Uh, and then products start around 1920 with the assembly line. They are anonymously mass-produced copies, and they're widely distributed. And gizmos are on the era of computers, so they are short-lived interfaces to a network. They add new functionality with software, so you can change what it is that they do with software updates. Around 2024 CE, which did not come true, because this book was written before then, uh, he just decided as a science fiction author, he has liberty to just th uh, throw a date on there and be not embarrassed at all when that is not the year that occurs. Which he has done many times, and he's sure in this book it would also be the same, which it was. Uh, and spimes are data blueprints. Uh, so if you had a, a data blueprint that you could load into a 3D printer, um, which then prints an object for you, so let's say a hammer, but it's full of um, it's full of chips, that the hammer can detect how well it is being used and record that information. So it's like, oh, I don't shape, I don't fit the shape of my particular owner's hand very well, uh, or there's some other problem with how I'm being used. Then you throw it away and like it is tracked, like you're supposed to recycle that. So the chips help you track it and it goes back into a recycling pipeline where it is recycled to become the next hammer and that hammer is going to be re-blueprinted through that. That blueprint has now learned as like a living data blueprint that it needs to print itself again, but this time shaping to your hand better. Or any other improvement that it might get, it evolves itself through some simple artificial intelligence to become a new version of that product. And it's not a product, it's not a gizmo, it's a spine, it is like a living thing. Uh, and so if you had hunters and farmers that used artifacts, machines were used by customers, products were used by consumers, gizmos are used by what are now called users. We started to get that um, 
the verbiage come into use, then in the age of spines, we could say that spines are made for wranglers. So this is an idea of the techno-social complex that we might have perhaps in the future uh, as a, uh, a speculation of where uh, this might evolve to. That is the entirety of my talk. So uh, during Brandon's talk, I was quite, uh, quite enthused, and there was a particular discussion that came up at the end that I found fascinating and didn't get to contribute. But it was sort of like, I took it as like being sucked up into the mesh of like, why do we have all these branches of philosophy, right? Like, what are they all doing for us? Like, which one's, which one's primary, which one is central? Um, you know, how do you know that you need all these and so on? Um, Right, and so there's a few, there's ontology, you know, what categories of things are there, uh, what's real. Phenomenology is like, what is experience, right, just recapping. Um, right, epistemology is how do we know things, ethics, what's right, uh, aesthetics, what's beautiful. Um, you know, I think, I don't know what the history was, it's supposed to be like, there was like the good, the true, and the beautiful, right, and that was like, uh, what, aesthetics, uh, epistemology, and, or ethics, aesthetics, and epistemology, I think. But out of these three central things, we keep sort of adding more things, right? And it's like, how many of these are there gonna be? Um, okay, so there might be some picture like this. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I feel like the goals get confused, right? People will start to say things like, oh, this isn't an ethical theory, right? Or whatever, it's not really an ethical theory, it's just something else, it's just an ontology, or right? it's just an epistemology. And like, I don't know, this bothers me when people, people pull that, because I'm like, you know, the question, right? How does this theory tell us not to be a Nazi, right? I loved, was a Phil, uh, right? Like, great question, right? And it's like, is that the test that we apply? But if you just say, well, oh no, that's not, I'm not in that business, then like, you just sort of skirt the issue. Uh, or it's claims like, you don't get ethics from epistemology, right? You can't derive an, an ought from an is, right? Like, these kinds of things that I'm like, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't have a better justification than that, but I, I'm, I don't like it. <laughs> but as I've, as I've thought about that, like that ick that's inside me, I've started to wonder, and now this is gonna be like part speculation, part comedy act, I, I don't know, but can we do something better? And the thing I've wondered about is now, does each branch of philosophy contain the others, right? That if I start from any one of them, I can get the other four, right? If there's five that I'm, I'm saying here, from any one I can get the other four. Is that actually true? And if it is, what would that mean for our philosophy? Okay, so what do I mean by this, right? Well, okay, I said philosophy contains you know, these five branches, there might be more than that. But in a way, this was an ontology of philosophy, right? I'm saying like, these are the categories of philosophy that exists, right? I can count them up. Um, you know, why do I care about all these? Well, because they exist. Because I wanna know what's out there, I wanna have a complete ontology. Okay, that's one way to go about things. But then I might have an ethics of philosophy, right? What ethical reason do we have to study all these types of philosophy, right? And you might say, okay, well, like, let's take ontology. If our ontology is wrong, then our ability to materialize our ethics will suffer. If our, or if our epistemology is hand wavy, right? These are the things that will prevent us from knowing how the world works. And any ethical theory you have, you just won't be able to execute it because you don't know how the world works, okay? Uh, same with phenomenology, right? It might help ground our ethics in actual experience, right? Like, okay. So these are all like ethical reasons to study these things, and they're different than what the purists in those fields might be concerned with, right? It's an ethics motivated ontology, an ethics motivated epistemology, um, right? And so on and so on, right? We have to do an epistemology of this. How do we know that there all these fields exist? Uh, is there a phenomenology of these? Uh, how do I feel when I study each of these? I'm just kind of making this up. There are the aesthetics of it. What aesthetic reason do we have for all of these? Um, and so we might get to a place where we're doing philosophy of philosophy, which is that from each of these, we have to study the other. Um, and you can kind of keep doing this ad infinitum. And you know, the question would be like, does this bottom out somewhere? Uh, yeah. So I, I invite uh, over a beer tonight, you know, anyone who has comments on this. <laughs> um, <laughs>